I want to thank Anderson Kenny for joining me at the Carriage Barn tonight to moderate this discussion. Anderson launched his residential and commercial architecture firm in 2014 and nearly two decades of working, sorry, after nearly two decades of working in the, in, with industry leaders such as Peter Marino and Michael Graves. A lifelong artist himself, his practice embodies the char a charismatic approach to the art of architecture. Uh, he joined the board of directors of the Carriage Barn in 2018. Um, we're joined tonight by Amy Vischio. Uh, she is an abstract artist exploring color and texture in her large scale pieces. Amy's skilled in photography, design, branding and identity, editorial planning, integrated marketing and management, and she's used those skills to lead the creative direction of Mothly Media publications for 16 years. Um, she's the perfect addition to this panel and I thank you for being here. Um, Donna Benedetto, is a decorative artist working in many mediums, um, including paper, oil, grass, wood, and metal. She owns Donna Benedetto Designs, a full service interior design firm that specializes in classic design with a modern twist. We're also joined by Migs Burroughs. Migs is a full-time graphic artist. He's designed hundreds of logos, ads, brochures, and websites for commercial and nonprofit clients. Uh, a photographer, He's won particular acclaim and for his lenticular photography and, and an example of one of those pieces is here. And he's exhibited several of those pieces at the Carriage Barn. Um, these pieces explore the change and transition in his subjects. He's also the founding, uh, a founding member of the Artist Collective of Westport and uh, was an artist in residence at the Westport Public Library. We're also joined by Yvonne Clavelou. Uh, Yvonne is an abstract artist who creates mixed media pieces that explore color and form. Uh, you can see her work in galleries and stores throughout the Northeast and in Florida, and of course here at the Carriage Barn Arts Center. Um, her creative journey has taken many forms and uh, she has run her own interior design firm and she's worked as a head stylist for At Home Magazine. Thomas Healy is also with us. Thomas works in oil, acrylic, watercolor. He primarily paints landscapes. Uh, he has spent time as an elementary art teacher, as a corporate art director, and currently is the principal of a full service marketing agency. He also specializes in architectural renderings and home uh, illustrations. Emily Kelting is a photographer and for the past 17 years, owner of Great Scapes, which is a full service uh, landscape design, installation and maintenance company um, serving properties throughout Fairfield County. She's taught landscape design and photography classes through the New York Botanical Gardens and she speaks with, for the Garden Club of America. And she's actually going to be teaching a workshop here at the Carriage Barn um, on October 17th on iPhone uh, portrait photography. Kelly Rossetti, uh, whose piece on the right here was included on the graphic for tonight's event, um, spent 14 years in the fashion industry in visual merchandising and sales before becoming a full-time painter. Um, so she credits her color influence uh, to her time spent uh, analyzing color combinations and coordinating uh, collections that she did for for those many years before she turned to her art. So welcome to all of you. And Anderson has um, some specific questions. I wanna start out with a question really directed towards uh, Amy. Um, your work as a creative and design director at Moffley, you're confined to a small printed page or computer screen, or now sometimes even you know, as small as a, as a phone screen um, with mobile media. Your paintings, on the other hand, are extremely large scale and abstract in nature. Um, you know, you paint, I know some of your pieces are as big as uh, six by 15 feet. Is this a reaction to, you know, the work that you do in, in your sort of other life as designing for a magazine? Is there a connection um, between those things? Or, you know, I, I'd love to hear about that. Never really thought about it in that way, but uh, the truth is, I um, have just started doing these very large pieces. I typically would work in a, a smaller format, but um, 
my mother, who was always my creative influence, and I've been speaking about her more than ever, um, she passed away last year. Um, when, when she found out that she had pancreatic cancer, she looked at me with a big old smile and said, you're gonna need to do something really big. <laughs> and we were very close. And um, it wasn't until after you know she was gone, I really started to think about, she was like, you need more color and I think you should go big. And I sort of, for a while, didn't do anything. And then I started doing very large things. And um, I don't think it had any, uh, any, any departure from the confines of a print page or anything like that. But I think it was just more of art therapy for me, just a departure and a freedom and um, what's to really worry about, just explore something new, which is all she really wanted me to do. So um, once again, she brought me down a good road. Oh, that's, that's amazing. That, and it's seeing all these pieces surrounding you. I can't believe that it's just been, you know, only a year or so that you've been really focusing on these larger pieces. Um, and, you know, anyone can jump in on, you know, on this sort of theme, but do you feel like you have more freedom and are able to take more risks with your painting versus, you know, versus your very much work life. Very much so. I mean, especially with these larger pieces, I actually have no control, which I, as a photographer, I control every aspect of everything I see from the composition to the technical side of things. And as a storyteller, as a creative director and being in media for so long, um, my job is to bring many things together to align with a brand or a story. And as a visual communicator, I tend to really harness every individual piece that comes together and make it the best it can be, but it takes a lot of control on all fronts. With the large format painting, I have to say as a little person, I'm like five, two and a half, um, I don't have a lot of control over what's happening. And I think that's, um, that's kind of freeing in a way. It's, it's just a, it's a completely different way of um, going about my artwork. I, I have a bachelor's of, of fine arts and I really was a realist. So there I was, you know, really tight and um, very much into realism. So this is just a, a departure and um, it's, it's a completely different thing because I'm not in control completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that must be, feel freeing. Very much. Does any, um, Anderson, do you wanna to go to your question or, or if anyone else wants to sort of chime in on that theme, please do. Yeah, I can jump in anytime. Do you want to go to Donna then? Sure. By the way, thank you all for uh, being part of this. It's, um, it's uh, phenomenal work and it's great learning more about you. And I'm so pleased to see when I was reading all of your bios, how many of you are in the design field and kind of, you know, uh, straddle that line between fine art and design. I think that we need more of that um, in, our, in our design um, just generally. Um, Donna, uh, I really love your work and, um, you know, I noticed that you work in a lot of different mediums, uh, paper, oil, glass, wood, metal. Um, you've also de described your, um, your design work as classic with a modern twist, which I think is very interesting. How does your expertise working in various artistic mediums inform your design aesthetic? So it's interesting. I started in a pretty roundabout way. I started off as a decorative faux painter for many years before I got into the full service design and um, have kind of translated a lot of the things that I learned when I was doing the faux painting um, to canvas. Um, I just, I'm really intrigued by working with different mediums. I, I think, you know, the design business, every project, I'm looking for a different piece of art for different client projects. And I know other mm -hmm. interior designers are as well. 
Um, an abstract might be right, but a sculptural piece might be right. Um, so, so people are looking for a mix of different types of art. And I, I just like experimenting with it. I don't think I've settled on anything in particular. Like I really like the textured sculptural paper pieces. I like the glass pieces. Um, I like three dimension and I like transparency. Um, so all of that really kind of affects, you know, I think like Amy said, it's, it's very freeing and sometimes you just don't have the control. It's just like you start with a particular medium and you just keep going with it. Yeah, I love that idea because it's, um, you know, it, 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 it kind of go, it's very ambitious and I think bold and it goes against what we think of in terms of, of contemporary art. I mean, you know, you walk into a client's house who collects art and it's like, oh yeah, you know, you point to that wall, it's like, I know who that is, and who that is, and who that is. It's, it's like checking boxes. And what I hear you saying is, gosh, let's be a little bit freer about it. Let's be a little bit more Joseph Boys and kind of take a little bit from there, a little bit from there, a little bit from there, and kind of mix it all up and not necessarily be a brand. I have a, I have a question about, about sort of on that theme and on the theme of inspiration. So in this, uh, in our current show here, we asked our members to submit work that um, that reflects on or relates to or was created in the year 2020. And um, a lot of our member artists expressed their struggles, their profound uncertainty and sadness this year, the isolation they've been feeling over the last several, several months. And, but overwhelmingly these challenges really resulted in their collective need to uh, create and look to the future and sort of, you know, find something positive and move forward or find something joyful and or soothing, you know, um, despite all of this. Um, we saw that uh, many of many of the artists exhibiting in this show took their inspiration from nature, from color, from their everyday surroundings, uh, from their loved ones, and uh, in some cases for our nostalgia for the past. Um, and I'd love to hear from each of you what's really, what or who is inspiring you now, you know, particularly as a result of what's going on right now or the times that, you know, we've sort of experienced in the last few months, have those inspirations changed? So my work is really um, usually very colorful and um, bright and I, I, when I go in the studio, I just kind of let it all go. And I feel I've been hearing from a lot of artists that they're having a, a hard time during this period um, getting in the studio. But for me, I, I take everything that's going on in the world and I just put it all on the canvas and it's very freeing. Um, the colors that I um, use are very saturated and bold. And um, I'm hearing from people that they want to see the color and that makes them happy. And so I think what's going on right now, people are wanting happy works and, and work that will bring them joy in their homes. Um, so for me, that's, um, that's what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm, it's been great for, my, for me as well as for other people. And I go back to, I look at the water, I go for walks, I get inspiration from everything I see from my background, from my Cuban background, um, which is very tropical colors and um, very loud. Um, when I'm with my family, it's everybody's talking over each other. And I think that that comes out in my work. And um, so that's, that's what I'm feeling now. And I'm, and I'm loving it. I'm, I'm, putting it all right on the canvas when I'm feeling. Great. Yeah, I really do feel like a, a lot of the work um, in this current show, and I hope many of you have had the opportunity to come see it. Um, we're open through next Sunday, but there was so much work that was um, really felt very joyful and positive and, you know, colorful or, um, but, you know, at the same time expressing other feelings too. Um, Kelly, is, would you like to, I know you work also and, you know, using a lot of color. Is there anything you want to add to that, to what Yvonne was saying? Well, it was hard because it was cutting out so much I could hurt her with the name, but, um, 
yeah, when COVID happened, everybody was just feeling so much anxiety and tension. And it was hard for me to get into the studio in the beginning. But once I got in there, I started laying down so many colors that I don't typically use. And um, it felt really, really good. And, and even now you can kind of see my work. I've been back to really, really bold, bright color. And um, it feels great for this time. It's like, it's kind of what you guys were saying, what Yvonne was saying, it makes people happy. And I want to see color on my walls. I don't want to be boring, white, plain, muted. I want color. I want to feel something. And you really feel more when you, you have more color going on. So, yeah. Great. I, I have felt a real connection to nature and my, my garden as a, as a, um, as a landscape designer and as a avid gardener, I, I really feel like it is, um, it's, um, it's just made me focus more on the, on the, on the, on the bees, the birds, um, without the airplanes, you hear them so much um, better. And it, it, it's really been a connection to um, my garden and also um, I can walk to the beach and I do that a lot. I was just, um, I didn't want to talk over anyone. I, but I was thinking of, you know, something about how nature, when people are ang ang anxious and are anxiety ridden, um, just grounding themselves with nature is something that is highly therapeutic and really effective for a lot of people. And the, um, I'm not a saturated color person by nature. I'm actually a neutral person. I feel very peaceful with a very hectic job in life. Coming home to a neutral place makes just makes me have my own thoughts and I can hear my own thoughts and I'm at home with neutrals. But what has happened with COVID with all of, you know, the world stopped. I mean, it, it was quiet and it allowed me, I think, to explore color and saturated color. Um, the piece that is right here was inspired by an oyster shell. And a lot of pieces around it um, are a, a, a different study of those. And I was really just looking around nature as a lot of artists do to just really connect with something that is real and is it feels permanent and because there was so much uncertainty. So I think a lot of the artists here, I was looking at Mig's piece, I'm in love with that, that piece of that house over the seasons. I think nature just has its own story and all the colors like Yvonne's saturated colors from the Cuban you know, background um, and Kelly's, I think they all have a place and neutrals do too but I think nature will continue to inspire us. And as long as there's something like COVID going on, um, I imagine that people are connecting with nature in a way that, that they never have before. They're off of the train. They're not commuting. They're not doing those things anymore. I'm, I'm a, a lapsed painter, so I have great admiration for everyone else on the panel who paints because I never I don't think acquired the skills and the wherewithal to express what I wanted to express, but this uh, lenticular um, medium that I use, um, which uh, Amy was kind enough to mention, which showed the house changing in seasons. And this also, this piece here, which uh, little uh, children that end up showing who they turned into, which are criminals from the 1900s. Um, this 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 was exhibited at the carriage barn. There's a series of 24 of these in a grid, but this is this is manageable as four. Anyway, just it's all about transitions, and what's interesting is that's universal. I mean, we're into more transitions on a day-to-day, minute-to-minute basis than ever. But I think we're all fascinated by the change. Constant, we're in constant flux and change, and. I try to capture it somehow or a little moment of that, a slice of that, whether it's aging or, you know, this is more, I did this three years ago. It's more relevant than ever. You know, uh, we're all born as innocents and how did we get to where we got to and what choices did we make and what choices were made for us? 
And these are things that we have to, th there's no answers, but we things we have to think about and every choice comes with a consequence. You know, I mean, any one of us right now could walk off screen and get in a car and drive to an airport and go somewhere. The consequence would be, where did they go? Why did they abandon this? Why did they leave the talk? What happened? What? So I, I'm all into like exploring the consequences of choices and, and trying to capture little slices of choices that we make. Yeah, I, while you're speaking, could you, could you share with everyone a little more about the process of creating your lenticular pieces and how you came to that? Yeah, well, my father, I mean, you know, I, again, I tried to, I went to school at Carnegie, well, it's now Carnegie Mellon, I went to Carnegie Institute of Technology, which turned into Carnegie Mellon when the Mellon family gave them $400 million for the naming rights. So I went to Carnegie Mellon as a, as a, a theater major, and then my first job out of school was a, in a newspaper. But my father was an animator when he was a young man. He, he was an animator for Walt Disney on the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which is the first feature length animated uh, film and as I was growing up and my brother he used to show us how animation worked and it was just kind of this magical like 24 pieces of paper flipped through could make a, a motion it wasn't much like 24 pages might go from here to here but there was emotion conveyed there was action conveyed there was intention conveyed and that's as a little kid, and I don't know, it stuck with me. I became a lot of designer, a painter, tried to do a lot of things. And it, later in life, I discovered this lenticular process, which I guess kind of prompted this, you know, latent desire to animate something. And I'm not an animator. I can't really paint or draw very well, but uh, this gave me the ability to show transition. Uh, the first piece I did was my mother, I got found her, high school yearbook picture when she's 17 and everyone said she looked just like uh, Ingrid Bergman, which she did. And then I took a picture of her when she was 97. So in just the way these change in a blink of an eye, my mother went from 17 years old, she, she changed 80 years trans, I don't like to say aged, 80 years, uh, there was an 80 year difference between the two pictures and you know, you have to decide is, is, is beauty timeless and is time limited? You know, I mean, it's just, there's a lot of things to explore. Well, if your mom looked like Ingrid Bergman, she was probably beautiful her whole life. Yeah. Well, that's what, thank you. Well, that's interesting. I don't have it to hear to show, but uh, yeah, just like these, there's an overlap in the images. I mean, the nice thing I like about this kind of thing is the, the viewer becomes a collaborator because you have to move when they're on, I'm moving it for you, but when you're, it's on the wall in the gallery, the viewer has to do the lenticular shuffle and go back and forth and you can catch it in between. You can decide which view you want to see. You can decide whether you want her to get older or younger or both or quickly or slowly. And uh, so, but the halfway in between kind of then the beauty of the 17 year old shines through the, and just like these, the, the, the innocence of the little child, somehow it's, it seeps through the, the nastiness of the criminals that they became. These are all mug shots from the early 1900s from New York. Um, anyway, enough about that. Uh, so I have a question about technology because, um, you know, I think in, in your, you know, with your photography and also with your, um, just your business and graphics, you know, and, but not even just for photographers or, or designers, but even artists. I mean, technology is becoming so much more and more embedded into our lives. And, you know, even, you know, through doing what we're doing right now, you know, which, which probably never would have happened or we could never have imagined um, really doing a, a few years ago. Um, so how, how does this affect you all as artists? Do you feel like is, is your art an escape from, you know, this technology that's pervading our lives or do you actually see it as a way that enhances your experience as an artist, you know, by being able to be more connected and sort of get your work out there in new ways? 
for me, it's definitely allowed me to really concentrate on my artwork. I think especially during the, you know, real heat of the pandemic when I was home and, you know, really in the house and had time to really focus on the artwork. Um, definitely, I, I think this whole internet connection and being home and trying to stay connected to other people. I think artwork can really connect people in many different ways. Um, it's certainly moving. And um, I think this whole thing really has, has affected everybody. And I think artwork is really hot right now because of that. Do you find that you're creating more now than you were, say, before? You know, I think like most artists, right? You know, you can go and have the intention to paint. I know Kelly posted something on her Instagram the other day. And, you know, you could go paint. And some days it just flows very freely. And, and everything you do, you just hit it. And then some days you struggle and, and you just don't get what you're looking for. Um, and I think as an artist, you just have to know when to step back and when to just walk away from it or start another piece and then revisit it. Um, it doesn't always, it doesn't always flow. More specifically, I mean, do you, do you find that you get inspiration or um, uh, traction from, you know, social media, Instagram, Pinterest, things like that? Or is that, does that play into your work at all? It's always great to see what other people are doing. Um, but a lot of my work is really driven by my own client projects or other interior designers who reach out to me for projects or my client base um, who's looking for artwork. You know, they may be looking for something in particular. I might not have it, um, but it might, you know, intrigue me to just try a new material or, or try something out. Um, or if it's just not, you know, my kind of style or my thing, I refer them to somebody else. I think personally social media has been for me, um, Instagram has been really helpful. Um, people are seeing my work that otherwise wouldn't have the ability to see it. And so being um, really consistent with that has been very good for me um, and very helpful. So from, um, from that, that would, that's been huge. And especially now that gallery openings and exhibits, that's not happening, they're able to see my work online. Um, so that's been huge. Um, I have a question for, for Thomas Healy. Um, you have such a, a variety of, of background, you know, in your experience, you've worked with children, you've worked in the corporate world, you run your own uh, marketing firm now. And I know you also do, you know, home, uh, commission work as uh, architectural renderings and illustrations. Uh, but then you also do, you know, your landscapes that are, are much, you know, more, I guess, for yourself. I mean, yeah. um, so can you uh, talk a little about that? I mean, I know that, um, you know, in some ways our art is, is a way for us to sort of escape or, um, so is that what it is for you or? or is it really closely linked to everything else you do? Oh, so I started off really wanting to learn realistic painting. And through the years, I've done a lot of all sorts of portraits and house renderings. I just have samples here of like a dog portrait, um, house portraits, portraits of, um, I mean, renderings for builders. And then I've moved into uh, doing more abstract, looser things that are more about um, movement and feeling and so on. That, so I'm, I'm evolving. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like uh, your professional experiences connect with, you know, what you're doing um, now or, or, or do you sort of feel, treat them as, as two separate worlds? No, like? definitely connect. But there's so much now that you can see online and exposed to so many different artists. Um, I think that's great to see what other people are doing 
and that definitely influences my my painting and my illustration. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's I think they're connected and it's evolving together. I don't do much graphic design anymore. I don't do much logo design anymore. Um, Migs and I grew up probably doing mechanicals back in the old days when everything had to be put on a mechanical board to do a brochure. And it was a big to deal, a big deal that process before desktop publishing. So uh, the whole commercial art thing has evolved tremendously since the computer. So. What do you attribute the looseness that you were talking about to? Like how, how did you come to that in your evolution? Uh, just getting bored with the realism. <laughs> so this is semi, but um, I want to become more painterly. This is just a little study I did of a wave for a bigger painting. Um, just feeling that um, my paintings weren't really good enough and I wanted to get better. There's a lot of Russian painters that I, I look at online. A guy named Bado and that are really spontaneous and not so tight and more expressive. So I admire that. Um, for those of you who are connected to interior design, fashion design, or even graphic design, you know, these are um, all fields where there are trends, you know, things sort of come and go. And, and, um, and I'm sure Amy can, you know, attest to this, but, you know, sort of what's in and what's out and what's the, you know, what's hot um, is sort of an, a never ending cycle. Um, do you feel like this applies to art as well? I mean, it, in as you, you all sort of look around and see what others are doing, do you feel like there are, um, there are trends in art and is, um, do trends influence art or vice versa? Um, or, or do you feel like art is sort of in a separate realm? Um, no, the best quote I ever heard about being creative, being an artist or whatever, is from a, a photographer named Dwayne Michaels uh, about 30 years ago. And uh, somebody asked him how he may, keeps his creativity or where he finds his creativity. And he said, I practice being me every day. That's all I know. So you can't follow a trend and practice being yourself at the same time, I think. I mean, that's what I got out of it. It was almost like, in a sense, it sounds you have to put blinders on and just be who you are and not say, oh, I should go there because everybody's doing purple and blue today and everybody's doing this and that and everybody's photographing street people and everybody's, you know, it's a balance. I mean, there's no right answer, but that's what I took away from that was just trying to listen to my, my own voice, uh, you know, and, and see what I see and try to interpret it. I, I think um, to that end, Migs, you know, I think a lot of art um, for art's sake is very different than trying to um, follow a trend or curate your art around a trend. And there's nothing wrong with trying to sell your artwork to Mac, match maybe the latest craze in um, interior design or, you know, uh, fabrics that you're seeing everywhere. It's just, I think there, there are two tracks and uh, I, I come from the thought of, I guess, having a history or appreciation for art and history. Um, I think you have to, at some point, not worry about you know, what might sell or what might be on trend and do what is inside of you. You know, you have to stop looking at what everybody else is doing and think about what it is you're trying to express. And that to me is the purest form of art. Um, and then of course there's paying the bills. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I also think too, you know, as an artist, maybe because I come from the interior design uh, background, you know, do I keep in mind what's going on and what people are attracted to or colors that they're interested in? I do, but what's interesting is I think, you know, we all have an innate color palette that we're drawn to. And I know myself, blue is like my thing. I could paint blue, black, white, I, I could do that. I could do a variation of blue every day of the week. It's just what I'm drawn to. Um, and I think we all have an innate color palette, right? So there's something that we're very drawn to it. We're comfortable with it. We may wear it in fashion. We may have it in our homes. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, is it on trend? I, I don't think, you know, maybe abstracts right now are certainly on trend, but I think um, I think as an artist, you know, you paint what you feel. And I think art is so personal. I find, especially in my business, it's one of the hardest things for me to place because what I might think might be right for someone's interior is not something that speaks to them. And I think artwork has to really speak to you. Um, that's the most important part of it. So whether it's on trend, off to trend, if it doesn't speak to you, then, you know, someone's not going to want it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, that's absolutely true. And, and we've had, you know, we've had some events here where we've had um, people, people uh, speaking on, you know, collecting photography, for example, or, you know, um, just building your art collection and, you know, for all of their, you know, expertise and knowledge, um, not one, one, not one of them has not agreed that, you know, it just really comes down to what you love. You have to just, you know, go with what you love and you're gonna be, you know, it needs to make you happy forever. Um, now we did have, I know Anderson had a question for um, Emily and I think we just lost her again. Um, oh no, she's not back. I think so. So we'll try and get her back. But I see Kelly. Kelly's here. So um, do you do you want to start with her, and we'll see if we get. Sure. So um, Kelly, um, can you describe what drew you toward uh, the fashion industry, and um, what was that pivot point when you made the transition from fashion? to the fine art world. All right, so my first job um, out of college uh, was a production assistant. I actually went to school for business, so I didn't study fine art. Um, so I took a job, just it was kind of random in the fashion industry, but I had always kind of wanted to do that. I thought it would be cool. Um, so I was there for 14 years. And um, so I had various, you know, jobs I was as I was there, you know, uh, I was like the light box girl constantly looking at the lab dips and the, uh, against the pan tones and the light box. Is it too red? Is it too yellow? Is it too blue? Um, and then as I progressed in my career, I was doing more of like collections and visual merchandising. And then I guess at some point, uh, traveling a lot, just always, always busy. And I decided that, you know, it was a little bit too much, too hectic. So I, um, that's when I decided, now my, now my headphones are dying. Uh, um, that's when I decided that I wanted to go into um, fine art and really um, use my creativity in another way because I knew that was inside of me, but I wanted to do it in another way. So rather than, you know, putting different colors and print and pattern together on the wall with fabrics and garments, I kind of wanted to do that with paints. And so that's what I did. So I know several landscape designers and there seems to be a common thread between landscape designers and photographers, or at least photography. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I think about some of my favorite photographers like David Yarrow and, and Ansel Adams and people like that. And they're very, very dialed into nature. Um, is, do you think that there's an inherent relationship between photography and how it captures landscape and ways that other mediums don't? Uh, yeah, I think, you, like, like you said, it's really about um, uh, the light you, the, in nature. It's um, the, the light in both um, photography is key. When you, when you, when you photograph, um, 
in what kind of light you photograph. And it's um, when, if you go uh, out at noon on a hot day, it's going to be um, on a bright sunny day, you're going to get really sh shadows and um, highlights that don't have any de details in them. Uh, but if you go on a gray or um, a, uh, a gray or rainy day, the colors will pop and um, you'll get much better you know, detail. And in the, um, in, in the uh, hours before sunset and before sunrise and sunset, that's when the, um, the, 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 color, the, uh, the light is the best. And um, the, the uh, piece I have in this show, the sun, the sun shower piece is, um, is, is, is taken right um, before sunset and, and those, um, the, the light that shines on the, um, uh, on the uh, uh, parasols that uh, backlit and, and the light shines through and the light beams coming down from the canopy of the trees and is, is, is critical and is a landscape designer too. I mean, light um, and sun <laughs> um, photosynthesis and it makes plants grow and, um, and, and it's, you're trying to, you know, create a, um, a scene that is uh, that is beautiful, um, you know, in the, it, 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 with with your plants. That's your palette. Would you say your? Um, I mean, I know a lot of the your photography uh, includes people. Um, do you think you're more, you know, as a landscape designer? I have, I, I don't know. I, do you, are you? drawn to sort of capturing uh, people in those unique settings or I mean would you ever do you do you photograph just landscapes or are you really more sort of interested and drawn to unknown color um two years ago I I went um on a, a for my first photo photo um uh trip um a, a tour of it was India and um, the leader of that that tour was an incredible portrait photographer, and I had always been kind of shy. I'd always um, shied away from um, at a portrait photography and asking people, you know, if I could take the picture. And uh, but on this trip, I just I just really really got into portrait photography. We're kind of uh -oh. coming towards the end and um i don't know if, if anderson has any other specific questions but i did want to close on um by talking about the future um and as artists i'd really love to know from from all of you what you're most excited about right now what opportunities are most exciting to you um you know is it is it simply having more time in your studio to do what you do, or are you excited about collaborating, you know, with others, or um, more opportunities to talk and share um, your work with new audiences? Um, but you know, part of why I'm asking is, is as the Carriage Barn Arts Center, you know, what sort of exhibit opportunities and program opportunities and things that we can do that you would be really excited about, and you know, specifically. I know, Migs, you're very involved with the Artist Collective, and maybe you can sort of speak on behalf of, of that. And I know many of the rest of you are, you know, very uh, involved in the community of artists. So I'd love to hear from, from all of you what you think is sort of most exciting right now. And um, again, you know, what, what, how, can, uh, how can we keep evolving to create those opportunities? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, the Artist Collective of Westport is a very vibrant, member-driven group of 150 artists. And, um, you know, my father was president of what was called the Westport Artist Club in the 1950s, and that became the Westport Art Center, and that has since evolved into MOCA. Um, but they have not shown a great interest in including local artists. Uh, so we, the, art, the collective has kind of taken up that role. And it's great. I mean, you know, Yvonne's a member and is, uh, we, we try to, members on their own, try to find opportunities. And, and the Carriage Barn has afforded us great opportunities to, to um, 
exhibit on our own. And then we try to, um, like uh, October 7th, one example, we try to keep uh, relevant in these times. October 17th, we're having what we're calling a, an affordable trunk show in the parking lot of the Playhouse, Westport Playhouse, um, which will be uh, 27 artists exhibiting, you know, setting up easels, tables, whatever. I mean, it's kind of going back. It's, you know, it's kind of a retro approach to art, but there's, it's any opportunity. And I think art needs to be seen and artists need to be, the community needs to be engaged with artists and vice versa. And this is, it doesn't matter. You know, there's, a, I went to drama school and they used to say there are no bad roles. There are only bad actors. So there are no bad opportunities for artists. I mean, whatever is, is an opportunity to show your work. It doesn't matter where it is. I mean, uh, really, it shouldn't matter. Um, so anyway, that's where we're, that's how we're going forward, just exploring any opportunities and uh, taking advantage of the opportunities the carriage barn might offer. And it's, it's, I think it's been very healthy. Amy or Yvonne or Kelly or any of you involved in anything coming up you're particularly excited about or something that you'd like to see more of? I mean, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, online juried shows that you can apply for um, as an artist, if you can get your name out there and you can, you know, virtual obviously is not the same as seeing art in person, but at least it's an opportunity to have your work seen. So I'm trying to do that as much as possible. And um, now that my kids are back in school, I can be in the studio and paint. And that is so exciting for me. <laughs> so I'm just excited to just put my time in and keep on working. Um, I just am putting one foot in front of the other every day um, and seeing where my art journey takes me. And I'm getting ready to go to Florida for the winter where um, that is a big source of my inspiration. And um, so just looking forward to getting past this um, whole COVID thing and looking towards the future, hopefully. Um, and yeah, just painting away and hopefully this will end soon. Yeah. I think, um, I'm definitely in a uh, period of transition and um, I am trying to really reflect on what is most meaningful to me. Um, I am still learning so much about myself even after being in a creative field for so long. Uh, I am at a point in my life where I realize I'm like, wow, I'm on the back nine. <laughs> so. I am trying to be very deliberate and thoughtful about where I spend my time and, and what's fulfilling to me. So um, I suspect that my art will have a bigger place in my life, um, as well as my photography, I, because it truly is what brings me the most joy. And um, that is, I think that's what you learn when you lose people that you love who want you to keep on living your life in a way that, um, that they would be happy to, to see you doing that. So my mom's name was Joy. My middle name is Joy. And I am always going to be seeking that in, in a creative endeavor. I, um, I found this as I was trying to clean up the studio. Um, it's a paper plate. I don't know if you can see it. It's my hand. And it was done in um, nursery school. My mom sent me to a place called Creative Arts Nursery School. And I realized that no matter what's happening in the world, no matter what's happening in my life, that art and creativity really, and that means design, interiors, anything, um, creating something is what propels me forward. So pandemic, no pandemic, um, trying to do exactly what Yvonne said is like one, one day at a time, one step in front of the other, one, one slow day. But I think, uh, I think art and joy go hand in hand and we'll get through. Wow, well, so well said, thank you. Um, I wanna thank all of you so much for being part of this conversation. 
um, not only for sharing your art, but also for giving us a glimpse into your lives as well. Um, the mission and goal of our organization is to encourage creative expression, to celebrate artistic achievement, and to enrich the community as a whole. So you've all helped us do that tonight. And I'm so um, happy that we were able to share all of what you've all said with, with a wider audience and we'll continue to share that because there are others who uh, couldn't tune in tonight, but we're recording this and we'll share it in other ways. Um, so thanks to everyone who joined us tonight, especially our members and supporters who really make up the vibrant community, community that we have and also provide us with the support that we need. Um, if you're not currently a member, please join. And if you haven't already, please come see the, the member show that's here in the gallery before um, Sunday. Um, our next exhibit is Capturing New Canaan and it opens October 22nd. So we are just continuing to move onward and so um, happy that we're able to be open and have visitors come into the gallery and uh, people seem so excited to be able to be out there and actually see art right in front of them. And, um, and you know, see the work of, of all the artists in our community. Um, so this uh, recording of this talk will be posted on the website tomorrow. Thank you again. Thank you, um, Bob, for all your help behind the scenes here and to all of you for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello. All right.